So we're going to be live on Facebook. and So we're live. How's that for an intro as you clean your glasses and take your glasses off? <laughs> Are you, you, you're switching. Gla- you, do, you, you got some cool glasses there, sir. Yeah, I'm trying to be cool. Well, I'm not even going to do an intro because if, if anybody who's watching doesn't even know Brandon, you, you got your head in the sand for the longest time. And uh, I think this is the third time that we've connected. This is – you know, we've been there with your first company and my first version of game playing you, which shifted over. And I think we're all kind of curious to find out and fascinated by NIL and what's happening in that space. But when when I think of NIL, you've been in NIL for 40 years or 30 years. I mean, this is this is the foundation of what you built in your business, right? It's basically the same thing. Well, the new business, I think, you know, collectible exchange is perfect because these kids can now build their own little micro sites on my site. Yeah. You know, collectible exchange, the, the, the component in collectible exchange is athlete direct and enables athletes to build their own little micro sites to be able to sell their product directly to consumer. So it's perfect because I think the, 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 mis, the misunderstanding with a lot of the kids that are in school is, you know, they have stuff they want to sell, whether it's their autograph or products. And they think they could just go to the website of the school and sell it. And the school's like, wait a minute, we, we don't have control over that. We've jobbed that out to legends or diehards. And then they go to the bookstore and they're like, wait a minute, we don't have control over the bookstore. You know, that's Barnes and Noble or some other entities. So the kids are sitting there wondering how the school is going to support them. So what I've been trying to do is really make a connection with the bookstore and the website and then bring the NIL into the mix so that the kids have a room to come up with a product that they want to promote and they have the distribution because the quarterback in Iowa isn't going to, you know, the people that are going to buy that are the people in Iowa right. and then some alums. And basically those lists and that platform uh, of people are sitting with the Iowa website, the Iowa bookstore and that sort of thing. So you got to bring all that together. So to really do successful NIL marketing of products and even some services you really need the school to be involved. And in a lot of cases, you need the coach, but you definitely need that platform. Uh, and the school's got the licensing that the kids need as well. And that's, I think, the tricky misunderstanding with the NIL. And what I've been working on is more of the theme than the team, more of the theme of team than the individual. So I go to a team and I try to do the entire team because that's exciting for a, a fan of a particular school to just buy a team ball. And then I'm automatically connected with the star of the team. And then I'll do some side work there. So then at least everybody feels like they're getting a little slice of something. And then if things, if things evolve, I can then do some stuff with the star players. Yeah, I, I never heard about that. That's a great idea. But So I want to back this up. When I mentioned that you've been in this for a long time, an NIL deal is basically a licensing deal that you have done for years with Yankee players and then public appearances. Yeah. And So this is an extension of things that, how, when you knew that this was happening, you know, did you, did you say that this is going to completely disrupt college athletics or did you say, you know, I've seen a, what, it, what it has done for pro, pro players to go deeper into their own fan base. And I seen the response that everybody wins in this, you know, what kind of approach have you taken? To well, that? I think disrupt wasn't the word I was thinking destroy, but <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, the days of college athletics is really not going to be non-existent if it isn't already because yeah. it's really a pay to play now and the kids want money and they're pushing a lot of pressure on the coaches and schools to give them that money. And it's just a matter of time to they figure out how to get sponsors and, and famous or, or rich alumni to support. To me, I look at the opportunity that maybe we can educate. Maybe there's an educational component because what happens when the kids go to the pros, they're in the money. And they, they tend not to pay enough attention to this stuff. So maybe the college experience adds a little bit of an educational element to teach these kids about the money making and also what it takes to make money while they maybe have a little bit of time and also uh, an, an initiative like a hunger to make a few bucks when you're in college. So I always say the best way to make a million dollars is to learn how to make one. Yeah. So the experience for these kids, although some of the dollars may be bigger than others, they're at least learning how a dollar gets made and some of the components that get put into their brand and what it takes as opposed to just pointing that off to an agent or a marketing person. And maybe they do a good job. Maybe they don't. 
be nice if the kids actually knew a little more about it. This will give them the opportunity. But make no mistake, college athletics will never be the same. And I think the changes that will go on with college athletics are only just beginning. There will be more disruption, destruction, and there will be a bunch of schools without a chair when the music stops. I guarantee you that. Yeah. Do you see yourself working with some of these collectives that are coming together, these alumni syndicates that they're, they're putting together? Not really. I, you know, I'm not a fan of that. But that, that, that it's like you have this wide open sea and then you got to go find this little bucket of, which to me is like even double cheating. Like, let's not only cheat, because the whole thing's a cheat. But now like, let's, let's take this cheating to a higher level. Like, no, I don't. I mean, I, I want to do legitimate deals with the kids that will support the kids, show them how to make money. And if there's some alums that want to support that, they'll buy the products that these kids are coming up with. Yeah, I think, you know, if people donate money to a collective and they're giving it to the kids, it's just complete pay for play, yeah. which I'm not sure that's going to last. I think the NCAA is looking into it, and I think they're going to put a stop to it, frankly. But I, I like the idea of the kids getting the licensing money that's way, way overdue. What I don't like is that there's a lot of kids that are getting nothing out of this. You know, some of the smaller sports, the not so big names on the team. You know, team is team. You know, the offensive guard is important, and, and I think it will create a little resentment when they see one or two players making all the money and then a bunch of players not making much. Uh, yeah. I think that's going to cause a little bit of some problems there too. Yeah, I, I look at that. It, just being in <laughs> college athletics right now and working with our student athletes, I agree with you, and I don't think everybody wants to be an influencer. I think the easy thing above and beyond the power five because the majority of kids on the twos and threes – I think um, innovation, so them wanting to be in a solopreneur, which you hit on, you know, how do you start an LLC? Anybody could go back and do a summer camp at their hometown, regardless of whatever level, right? Everybody's going to support that. Everybody knows that kid growing up through high school and, you know, in, in kind of little league and all that. Kid's got a name for himself. The family has got a name. They can monetize that piece. And I think impact, overlaying in nonprofit pieces of it. Um, so a Division three soccer player, an eight-year-old doesn't know the difference. They still want to sign autograph from that kid. So that kid can monetize it, even if it's a giveaway, even if it's something that's going to be, you know, to, to them, it could be a collectible. What if that kid goes on to be a president of the, of a, of the Yankees at some point, you know, they got that autograph at a younger age. So I think there's some trickle down effect from that. Um, but I, I, I think there's two buckets to this and I agree with you. I think there's career development, business skill development by starting their own personal business, regardless of every level and finding a way to make an impact in the world using the platform that you're on right now. And that falls into your education piece of it. So, you know, but a big, if, a big thing, Rob is access. Yeah. And uh, you know, you start having access to these players where they can pay, you know, you can pay them to give you Intel pregame videos, interviews. I mean, I don't know if people realize the amount of stuff that a team, the radio station, the TV station can orchestrate, the licensing department, the bookstore. There's so many opportunities for the kids. They've got to be creative, and hopefully they've got somebody guiding them or they have the time. But it, there's there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, trading cards for the kids. You know, they can legitimately make money, give up their licensing, sign cards. That's a great stuff point. Like that. And then, you know, I think when teams get hot, you know, when there's the NCAA final, you know, the, the tournament in March, or the playoff system, you know, with the bowl games. There's definitely stuff for the kids to do around those bowl games. I would, if my team went to the Rose Bowl, I would love to have a helmet signed by a couple of players on that team talking about the Rose Bowl game. So I, I'm looking to see a lot more of that happen where you'll see deals getting done in those cities where the bowl games are happening. You know, after the Final Four with the championship team doing signings with the teams that made it to the Final Four. You know, I'm a big Syracuse fan. I would love assigned basketball by a team uh, that went to the Final Four that I've been following all year. So the fandom is there. The problem is, is that the norm of this is more national. But the problem is these are, this is going to be more regional opportunities. So it's not a national play if Syracuse goes to the Final Four. It's a regional play. And it's going to take a regional company to execute and expedite the deal with a lot of these deals. So it's interesting how things kind of will fall into place. And it's interesting, I see all these companies that really want to be the marketplace. I'm like, I'm telling you right now, all that's not going to work. Like, yeah. tomorrow, check in here, and we'll give you access to a whole bunch of kids. That, and then, then you got 
Like nobody's paying a marketplace just to give you access because in this day and age, there's no kid you really can't get to by DMing them, calling up the school, whatever it is. We, we don't need a platform just to tell a kid, by the way, I've got work for you. And then I'm first going to go pay the kid's agent or something else like, uh-uh. So you see these companies popping up and I feel really bad because a lot of people have invested in the influencers and some of these other companies and I just don't see them being around for long. Yeah, I think they're going to morph into more of a talent acquisition than anything else, right? Get get access to those kids from a talent acquisition side of it. If I'm a company, which is a massive issue right now. And I can do that myself. Yeah. You got to, you know, at the end of the day, especially in the initial stages when you have a new business like this and the industry expanding, you got to roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty. You got to dig into it. You got to get into the grind. A friend of mine says, you know, you got to get in the mud. You got to get busy you gotta, and you got to do it. There is no shortcuts. So, of course, there's a bunch of people trying to jump into the shortcut aspect. But there's a, there's a lot of great opportunities. I wish I was 25 years younger. Because, <laughs> um, don't yeah. we all? But yeah. you know, only because the real thing is like getting on these campuses with the kids and talking to them. And, you know, I'm 63 in the days of me traveling over the country. But I'm going to pick like 10 or 12 schools to focus on. And I'm putting yeah. a little team together. And those are 12 schools I'm going to hone in on. Instead of trying to take over the world, I'll just zone in on those 12 schools, work with the platforms, work with the schools, and then get into it with the kids. Because I love the educational part. I love the opportunity to make some money, but I love yeah. the opportunity to teach the kids about the money we're making together so that they'll be better off as they get into the pros. So dig into that a little bit. So if from your, without giving all your secret sauce away, right. But if I'm a student athlete and I'm going to cut a deal with you on any type of merch, I want to sell, I want to go in your marketplace from an NIL, you, you know, you're the master at this. What kind of deal is beneficial to us? What does that look like in perpetuity? So if I, if I want to license that deal, all of my autographs, everything back to you, whether that's video clips and highlights, whatever it is, how does that, how, how do you structure those deals? I structure them as a partnership. You know, I give the kid a little bit of front money and then I do a partnership, giving them most of the money. And I tell a kid, if you're betting on yourself, don't sell your game used, but let's catalog it. Let's organize it. Let's put it on your site and let's start building a customer base. So that when you do go to the bowl game or the final four or do get drafted, all that stuff is sitting there which is going to be an onslaught of, of people. And then you'll start really building up the most important, valuable thing, which is data and the assets and the emails and your customer base and the people that are fans and also the fans that would actually spend money with you as opposed to the fandom of they like you, but they're never going to put a dollar in your pocket. After they buy maybe a jersey or a T-shirt, they're not going to do much with you. And you got to separate that. So I would I, I would offer a kid a deal to build them a microsite help him put his game, use stuff on the site, do some autograph product that I lay the money out for the raw goods. Now we're partners with a kid in a collectible company of his own with his own brand, his own likeness. Now, if you're not a big name, I'll do that with like the whole defensive line. Well, I'll do it with the whole team. And, and that's kind of how I play that out. Um, but what I'm trying to teach the kids above and beyond that is how to kind of uh, collaborate with a few of the other players to go get the deals. It's too hard for some of the local companies just to do a deal with one player. But when they do things with three or four, you can team up with a radio station and do a deal with Subway. And everybody gets a $500 gift card. You post that you're eating your favorite sandwich right now at Subway. And then you cut a deal with ESPN local radio to promote all that. And then the kid gets a $500 gift card and a couple thousand dollars in his pocket. But again, that's execution. So you got to have somebody on the ground to put that together. But I think that's I, I can see some of the bigger schools having somebody on the ground. Like right now, I'm working with Michigan. I got a great relationship with the MDEN. Awesome. They're tight with the school. They got the website. They got the MDEN stores. Brilliant. Now I got Valiant, who does all the NIL at Michigan. They're putting together deals. And I'm helping facilitate uh, the collectibles, autograph stuff, and some licensed stuff, which I coordinate with the NIL kids. And I coordinate it with the MDEN which is the website and the stores, boom. Then as that progresses, I'll take some of my corporate relationships and I'll start working that out as well with Valiant. And we'll do some deals with some of my companies that I'm working with, insurance, Subway, like I mentioned, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, one of my favorite stories that you tell, I think it was Phil Rizzuto. You know, was it Phil Rizzuto way back when, when you first started with the check? 
Yeah, when we bounced the check, man. Oh God. Yeah, so. tell tell that so, because I mean that was the beginning of kind yeah. of this these deals, right? So tell that story if you don't mind. I'm just looking at this ball, I just had it. Yeah, you know, it's a full Rizzuto ball. Yeah, you can see that 1994 scooter, and I was just remembering like what a big year that was for me, even though it was a long time ago. And what happened was I had done this appearance with Phil, and um, the bank manager called me up from uh, Citibank, and uh, Gonzalez, the name was. It's like 1991. And he said, Brandon, I got uh, good news and I got worse news. <laughs> like, worse news? What, what, what do you mean? Well, I'll give you the worst news. Well, let me give you the good news. I did not, you, you're overdrafted. I didn't balance Mickey Mantle's check. Good idea. Don't make, because I was doing stuff with Mickey Mantle at the time. He goes, well, what's the worst news? He goes, well, I bounced for Rizzuto's check. I said, what? <laughs> then I got a call from Phil. Oh, God. Steiner, you Huckleberry. See, I know I couldn't trust you. Blah, blah, blah. So he bounced his check and he was really upset. So I called up Phil a couple of days later. I said, Look, it's my fault. I should have known better, but I'm going to make this up to you. And most people, they run away from their problems. And I always tell people, run to your problems, sprint to your problems. Don't avoid them. Don't make believe it never happened. Own it and then face them and then make it right. I, I said, Phil, I'm going to make this right for you. And I started booking Phil on a lot of appearances and stuff, making the money. And that was before he got in the Hall of Fame. And then sure enough, a few years later, you know, I had a pretty good run with Phil. I don't know if he ever forgave me, but, you know, you know, he's, when you're in the 70s, you never forgive anybody. But, he was kind of, you know, he's all right. He was giving me a hard time. And then he calls me up, and, you know, he gets in the Hall of Fame. And we go to his house, and I'm pitching him at Cora. And, and at the end, he goes, you know, Steiner, you Huckleberry, I'm going to go with you. You know why? Because we had that problem. You told me you were going to make good, and you did. You kept your word. And I feel like you're going to I feel like you're going to take care of me. If something goes wrong, I know you're always going to make it right. So you just never know. And that was a huge turning point for me to be able to sign a Yankee Hall of Famer. And that was before the Yankees got hot in 96. You know, they were kind of on a bad stretch then. And Phil was one of the bigger names. And to get him really led to getting a whole bunch of other Yankees and it really just snowballed. So it was a big break. So you run to your problems. Don't run away from them. And own up. Life, life's not, life's not perfect. You're going to make mistakes. But own it. And then make it right. You can always make things right. I always tell people when they call me, and I always try to take customer service calls. And the first thing I say is, look, I'm really sorry having this problem. But my goal in this call is to make it right for you to make this experience with my company right. And I'm going to do everything I can to do that. Not just to get you off the phone, but to make it right. And I, I think that level of customer service is missing these days a little bit, you know, with everything being so tech and digital. To me, I, I love when I hear from customers. I don't get excited when we've screwed up and made a mistake, but I'm e eager to get on the phone and make things right because I'm going to take that uh, bus and turn it into a boost. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Well, you are a mensch. There's no doubt about I it. Try. You know, I try. You're care a what mensch. People think. You know, I care about what they think about collectible exchange. It's a people's company. Now you can go on the site and sell and buy. And there's over 100,000 items on there. Like, I'm always thinking of the problems that maybe collectors or fans maybe have and trying to give them something that's going to wow them. My new talk that I do, Rob, is how you get to wow. That's what I've been spending time like, you know, I've sold $60 million of dirt, thousands of bricks, 25 or 30 million autographs. I've, how do you get to the wow? How do you come up with these ideas that really engage people from an op, you know, optically speaking? They go, wow, that's unbelievable. But how do you get to the wow? And that's my new talk that I've been doing uh, around the corporate circuit. It's been really good. It's been exciting. Um, I feel like I'm a kid again. So That's awesome. That's all. And, okay. and, you know, I mean, when you talk about the college athletic department side of it and, you know, you're mixing a mentorship, you're mixing kind of career development. Now you're, you're mixing in, how are they going to monetize this? If, if I'm an athletic department that I want a one-stop shop, I want someone to fulfill that autograph memorabilia stop for, how do you work within the athletic department to get those deals done? There's a business development guy in the, in the bigger schools. And, you know, right now the coaches are under a huge amount of pressure to deliver revenue for these kids. It is not easy coaching Division One athletics. It's never been harder. We've lost a lot of good coaches because of it. But you've got to 
get the coaches on board, and which they almost always are. But the real key is to get with the business development guy because he'll hook you up with the person running the website. He'll connect you with a bookstore, and then he'll connect you with the coach and the kids and who's handling those kids, and you got to kind of put it all together. And it's not easy, like, but, you know, I've been doing this a while, so it seems a little more naturally easy for me. And then you got to deliver, you know, smart ideas, good product. Um, and not everything's a home run. You know, these kids, you know, they're, that's why they're going to college. They're learning. So it's some hit and miss it. That's why I like doing the team uh, yeah. projects. Yeah. Yeah. It's better. So you don't have to one off everything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. P- plus you're investing. You're, you're buying all the merch. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of risk on your end. You got to move it. Yeah. I'm taking some risk, but I'm also connected with the alumni base becoming known to have a whole bunch of cool stuff that most people don't have. So yeah. it works. I'm not doing anything too large, you know, something fair. Yeah. But, you know, listen, the alums, like I'm a fanatical Syracuse guy. I'll buy yeah. everything Syracuse. So I'm not getting too far ahead of myself, but you know, my team is rock and roll and I'd like to have something hanging in my office. And that's what I'm thinking. And I'll yeah. build it from there. Well, anything else, any final, final thoughts, final words? Yeah. I mean, Enjoy college athletics. This will probably be the last year that we know it as it is. And in many respects, even that won't be true. But I would enjoy college athletics now because we're going to start seeing some of the older coaches checking out. I don't think they want to tolerate this. And be prepared for change. You know, be be ready for college athletes to really start acting and demanding to be dealt like, like a pro. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately – be prepared if you're a smaller school to maybe be really kind of left out of a potential shift in what the vision of your school's in and a shift that maybe the school says we have to shut down a couple sports. Yeah. Do you, do you see the realignment once the, the broadcast rights deals are done with football? Do you see that whole thing blowing up? And I do. Your- I, I think, you know, something, and particularly in football, I think it's, it would be great. I, I'm just tired of, you know, they're paying – an assistant coach at Alabama, more than than ninety percent of the Division One football teams and coaches. So the whole thing's really not fair. You got a hundred thousand seat arena, and then now you got some kid who's playing for a mid major. They're never really going to match up. I'd rather just get the Giants in one division. It'd be nice if you know a kid that went to Bowling Green or Syracuse or Rutgers, some of the smaller Division One schools. It'd be nice for them to win a championship. I don't think it's going to play out exactly that way, but. I think it's pretty obvious that the Big Ten, SEC, depending on what Notre Dame does, ACC, maybe. Maybe the Big 12 can figure it out. But you can really see four divisions in college football. What's going to be interesting to see what happens is with college basketball, there's so much more talent and it's a smaller pool that a lot more you can participate in a much wider way. So that would be really interesting to see how that plays out. And just, I think it's become obvious that these schools for a long time, been making a shitload of money. And I think when the kids start realizing how much money that is, they're not going to be settling for this NIL. They're going to be like, hey, we want a piece of that. We want a piece of that $100 million TV deal and all that, and which is what I would have done right out of the gate. I would have just, I would have let the schools and the NCAA be able to market the kids so it's all part of one. And I would have just gave all the student athletes some percentage of the overall revenue and just get to the potatoes instead of, you know, skipping the potatoes, getting to the meat. Cause now they, the NIL is just the crumbs. Yeah. They're not getting any of the big money, but they really are deserving of that, some of that big money too. And the, the league that shows where everything is going and the league that could probably stand tall for all this is the NBA. They're in a legitimate profit share. The players have seen the ups and even a little bit of the downs and they understand they're in a pure partnership, and it seems to be really working. Yeah. All the other leagues, are, to me, are on notice. And what happened with the PGA could be happening with a lot of other leagues because the players are getting smarter, and they realize how much money is being made, and they realize they're the ones driving it. And at some point, we're going to see a lot more of this new money coming in trying to steal and grab teams, leagues, and stuff like that. I mean, I think it was really – I mean, $2 billion, you bought the, you bought the golf league. With two billion dollars, you came and buy an NBA team, right? So I look for a lot of changes in sports in the next few years. Um, remember, there's not this whole family thing going on with that's only teams. I mean, you're talking about big, big 
high profile business people that are owning these teams. So this is a, a business that also happens to be a sport. It used to be a sport. And by the way, it's a business too. Now it's a business. And by the way, it's a sport too. And you're going to just see more high profile mergers, acquisitions, hostile takeovers, like we just saw in golf, more hostile takeovers coming and more demands from the players to, to get paid a lot more because there are so rare the talent that gets to that level and they're going to demand more. Rightfully so. Yeah, rightfully so. But you're, you've been at the forefront involved in this thing for a long time. I'm enjoying myself. You know, I, yeah. I, I love my marketplace. It's very unique. It puts the, you know, really gives the, the talent an opportunity to control what they're doing. And more importantly, it gives the fans out there the ability to trade and swap in a safe, authentic environment, which is always a concern to me. Um, you know, I, I have tons of, I mean, hundreds and thousands of collectors that are sitting with a lot of stuff. And if you fall out of love with a few things, what do you do with it? And it's got to be a better place than eBay. I mean, eBay is just terrible. So this platform has really found its way with a lot of big collectors. It's safe. It's legitimate. It's a little more higher end. I'm excited. Yeah, I, yeah. I love it. No, you definitely should be. How do people find you? Well, I'm a big LinkedIn guy. If you if you have a question, go on LinkedIn, follow me because I'm over the limit. I'm not sure how that works, but you know, just <laughs> message me on LinkedIn. Uh, follow. I put a lot of content on Facebook, or if you go to brandonsteiner.com, it's where all the speaking information is. And uh, definitely, by the way, go to Collectible Exchange and if you want to get one of my three books for free. Just go to Collectible Exchange and you can pick up one of the books. They're pretty good. I'm working on a fourth book, so to be discussed. That's not the wow book? No, nah, this is going to be a very, very unique book. There's two books I have left of me before I die. One is going to be completely non-sports, and it's a fascinating book. And then one of them is a tell-all book. I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually outlay a lot of details. and, and Oh, boy. Um, I'm going to lay it all out. And you know, some of it's going to be great. Some of it's going to be like hey, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's just going to be what it is. And you're going to be in a witness protection program with all the other mobsters in New York. You'll be hiding yeah. out in Iowa. You'll be out there, Iowa, with the quarterback. That's all good. <laughs> hey, by the way, speaking of witness protection, I'm doing a signing with Donnie Brasco, who's in witness wow. protection. And yeah. I got a call from him, and we're doing a signing at the end of August. Like, I love all the random, yeah. you know, I'm doing Indy 500 collectibles. I'm doing a lot of random stuff that I was never able to do at the old company at Steiner. Now at this new company, I can really just do small niche projects, which is why I like the NIL. If I was at Steiner, uh, we never would have touched the NIL, but it's not big enough. Now I can, I can jump in a few players at a school and have some fun with it. I don't have that pressure now, you know, to, that, that bottom line pressure. I just want to do what makes me happy. And most important, what makes fans go, wow. And so my only two initiatives, that's it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you've been doing it for years, and you sold Yankee Stadium like no one else could, and you know, you're just a legend in this industry, and every time I catch up with you and follow you, you're just doing more and more things. So inspiring to be able to not just have Steiner Sports and then the 2.0 version, 3.0 version, and and then the final version of, you know, winging that bomb across, you know, East River <laughs> into Manhattan on, the, uh, on that last book, you know, telling all it's the dirty funny. stories of the Yankees. Yep. I can't wait. It's fun. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Well, thanks for your time. All right, man. Uh, Have a great day, everybody. It's a Friday. Enjoy yourself. Go pick up the book. See you later, everybody. It's Rob Thompson uh, from ConnectSports.com. See you.